Our first speaker this morning is Mr. Adam Russo. He's the co-founder and chief executive officer of the FIA Group. They're an experienced provider of healthcare cost containment techniques, offering comprehensive claims recovery, plan document and consulting services designed to control healthcare costs and protect plan assets. One of the things that uh, Dr. Keith Smith reminded me as we get ready for Adam's uh, presentation, there is a glossary for you uh, so you can keep track of all the technical self-insurance terms because uh, you guys are generally focused on trying to prov provide care to patients. And he's going to talk about how to make sure you can do that. So join me in welcoming Adam. This on? Yep. Well, the glossary is actually a Boston accent glossary. Okay, so when I say water, that means water. I think that's how you'd pronounce it here, correct? Um, guys, it's great to be here. Uh, I was here last year for the first one. This is literally double the size. And it, I was actually wondering on my flight here from Boston yesterday how big this would be, because I didn't even ask you, you know, what the attendance would be. So when I walked in here, I was pleasantly surprised. And I said, wow, this is, this is great. But I can tell you this. I do about somewhere between 70 and 80 of these a year. It's the only one I do on a Saturday. It's very strange for me to speak on Saturday mornings. Usually I'm in bed right now, but it's fine. I don't mind doing this. And I actually hope that you have a hangover because my job is to wake you up. My goal is the people in that back table over there. Yeah, you, that, that woman that's looking at her iPhone. Yeah, <laughs> not for long. I will be calling on you throughout this presentation. This is what I like to call edutainment. We like to interact, we like to ask questions. I will use a lot of terms that you don't understand. Raise your hand and please ask. Do not be afraid to ask questions. I will make fun of you, but it's fun for everybody else. So let's just, so let's just have a good time with this. Um, first, I wanna say, obviously, thank you so much to Dr. Smith and Mr. Kempton uh, for putting this together. I wanna give them a round of applause for what they've done. What you have to understand, folks, is I, I go to many conferences, and pretty much most of the conferences I go to, it's the same stuff over and over again. You can literally take a conference agenda from 2009, copy and paste it to 2015, and it's maybe just shift around some of the speakers, but the exact topics are the same. And nothing ever happens. Nothing ever changes. And I think one of the reasons why um, I guess I've been sort of successful in my career is that I've actually tried to challenge some of that change. So it was many, many years ago when I first uh, saw Dr. Smith speak, and I was one of those weird groupies, you know, like in the back, and I was waiting for him to finish, and I ran up to the front, and I just was dying to just touch the guy. I'm like, oh my God, who are you? How? I've never seen anyone like you before. And it really changed, it's really changed in the industry. I mean, I could tell you that wherever I go, if I'm in Missoula, Montana, if I'm in LA, if I'm in Miami, I'm in Boston, somebody brings up his name no matter where I go. And I always tell them that I have the privilege of being his friend and for working with him for many, many years now and for spreading this message of, free, of the free market. So it's an honor to be here. All right, I'm not used to having this microphone in a hand because I'm afraid that I'm gonna like hit myself <laughs> because I move my hands around a lot. So I'm gonna do the best I possibly can. So what are we gonna talk about today? Oops. We're gonna talk about a little bit about who I am. People are like, who's this young kid? I know I look very young, I'm like 32. Um, well, how does he know anything? What, where, you know, what's his background? We're gonna talk about costs and what do you care about? Here's the problem. Everything that we think is important, nobody else thinks is important. Okay, we, I can try to pretend that this message is resonating amongst every employer, it's resonating about amongst every third party administrator. That is a, in the glossary in the back. It stands for TPA, okay? So when I say TPA, it means third party administrator. It's someone that processes the claims. To think that every TPA cares about transparency, every employer, every broker, I wish they did, but they don't. And that is the fundamental problem. We're gonna talk a lot about costs and what each individual entity within our industry actually cares about. We're gonna talk about the growth of self-funding. It has grown tremendously. I can tell you that I expected that to happen once healthcare reform came around. I think the greatest thing that ever happened to the self-funded industry, industry was Obamacare. I know a lot of people think I'm crazy for saying that, but I've been saying that for years. It has helped our industry, not hurt it, because it has brought us to the forefront. We are no longer hidden in the back. People have to know what's going on with health insurance. 
because it affects them every single day. It's on CNN, it's on Fox News. People talk about it and it's a great opportunity for organizations and people like ourselves to take advantage of that situation. Next, risk management. There's a lot of different things that the word risk means. We're gonna explain it what it means in the health insurance context. Last but not least, self-funding some innovation. Bottom line, most of the things that I talk about when we discuss innovation, you really can't do in our current healthcare model. You can't. The reality is most of the stuff that I say, if you went back to Blue Cross, United, Cigna, Aetna, I call them bukas, okay? Blue Cross, United, Cigna, Aetna. If you went back to a buka and said, hey, I had this idea, I saw this guy speaking and he was amazing, he was absolutely awesome, and I wanna do this stuff, they're gonna look at you and say, no, we can't and you'll go back to work. That's pretty much what happens. So I wanna make sure I have a disclaimer. Many of these things, the reason why you can or want to do them is because you're working with a self-funded employer, a self-funded plan, or an administrator that works with self-funded companies. Okay, so really quick. I started my, I mean, how many people have seen me speak before? So I don't wanna to waste too many people's time. All right, so like, wow, that's good. A lot of people have no idea who this crazy guy up front is. All right. I started my company in my mother's basement in the year 2000, I was 24 years old, and I had one client, one small third-party administrator client, he had 5,000 lives. I've literally been in the self-funded industry since I was 16 years old. I've always wanted to be an attorney, and I used to, because I, you know, unlike most people that say, you know, why, when I went to law school, okay, I was actually poor, okay? Most of the people that go to law school are not poor. But when they go to law school, they say, why are you here? They say, I'm here to help the poor. And I'm looking around, I'm like, I'm here to help myself. <laughs> I'm poor. I want to help myself, not be poor. I don't know about you guys, you know, but like, oh, we're here to I went to law school because I watched a lot of LA law. And Corbin Bernstein had a different girlfriend every week on his show. And I thought that he was the coolest guy on earth and I want to be just like him. And that's really true. But it really is true. Um, so I got a job in high school working for a lawyer whose brother owned a TPA, a small TPA, worked for him. And I worked there from high school, college, law school, got my uh, a master's degree in finance, I worked there. And then eventually I became director of sales at his organization. And at the, once I graduated law school, I decided, you know what, I'm gonna do this on my own. So I had $2,000 cash, I called my best friend from college who I knew was dumb enough, he's not a very smart guy, but he's a hard worker, he was dumb enough to do it. So we went to my mother's house, both of us, he moved in too, and we built FIA, and today, we're everywhere. Uh, our company right now represents 6.3 million employee lives nationwide. That is not made up, 6.3 million employee lives. Every single client that we have, every employer we have, is one employer at a time. We have never been bought, we have never bought any other companies, we've never acquired anyone else. We don't have any outside firms, we don't have outside advisors, we don't have any angel fund, no hedge fund, nothing. It's my best friend, Mike Bronco, and myself. We work with 243 TPAs. Oh. I appreciate that. We work with 243 third-party administrators, 41 stop-loss carriers, NGUs, 18 brokers. The toughest people in the world to crack are the brokers. Any brokers in the room? It's like, yeah, because they're all golfing, guys. And I mean on Monday, Friday, doesn't really matter. I mean, Saturday, definitely. Um, but 101,000 different employer groups. These are all groups that are all self-funded in the health benefits. From a five-life group to a 100,000-life group, they're all self-funded and they all have the same unique issues. And that's how do I offer health care and health insurance coverage to my employees at a reasonable price. And I think that part of the reason why what we do has been successful is our number one focus is actually trying to save money for these plans. And what we have done differently than most people out there is I don't try to cater our services to everybody. You don't see me speaking at a NAHU, which is the National Association of Health Underwriters. I don't speak at broker conferences. I don't speak at the large BUCA conferences. My goal is to help TPAs. My goal is to help the growth of self-funding. That is my number one focus. I do not, I'm not quiet about it. I tell every TPA, no, my goal is to make you bigger. If you grow, I grow. And I think this is an opportunity, a huge opportunity, to help the entire third-party administrator industry grow tremendously, and it's working. The connections that I made here last year already 
have provided dividends to at least 20 of my TPA clients, which is hundreds of employers across the country that have already taken advantage of just connections that I had on a random Saturday morning last August here in Oklahoma City. So I urge you to make sure you come back because, and learn as much as you can here today because what you're gonna get today and yesterday, really you won't see anywhere else. Okay, self-funding as a whole. I can tell you when I started my company, I did not know that this was gonna happen. I had no idea in a million years that, and I didn't know you could be, I don't know if you could see it that well, but 81% of all large firms, 200 employee lives or higher, are self-funded today, 81%. Now my first question is, where are the other 19? What are they doing? Their brokers are golfing right now, I guarantee you. But you have to wonder that question. So 81% of all large employers are self-funded, and then if you look at back in 1999, 2000, that was 60%. Huge, huge growth. Now, I've had people in the past, when I spoke in 2010, 2011, it was always about Obamacare, ACA, PAPACA, how it's gonna ruin our industry, okay? I've heard that so many, so many times. And I told people that they were wrong. I would literally tell people in the audience, you're wrong, this is the greatest thing that ever happened to us. We are competing with the government. Do you have any, you have an idea. I don't have to say, do you have an idea? Of course you have an idea. You, we have doctors here. Okay, I'm, this is like the greatest place to like get hurt or like get sick, right? It's free, right? I'm assuming you guys are gonna take care of me for nothing. I would hope. I don't have any insurance cards on me. Oh, by the way, my company is a self-funded plan. I wanna make sure I let people know that. So the stuff that I'm talking about, the spew that's coming out of my mouth, we actually do in my office first. So Chris Aguiar, one of my guys, one of my attorneys in the back, he is a guinea pig. We've used every service on Chris first. He's still here. He's still smiling before. No one said you could talk, but that's fine. <laughs> one day you'll get a mic. Like in 20 years. Uh, <laughs> if you ever watch our webinar, listen to our webinars, okay? We do an hour-long webinar every month. We have about 4,000 people that listen to our webinars. Um, it started with like 20 people, like my mother, my wife, my sister. <laughs> and now there's like 4,000 people in a month. We give him one slide. He's always just had one slide. He hasn't deserved two slides yet, but maybe one day. But the point I'm trying to make is, if you look at self-funding, it's grown tremendously, no question. But people said, well, with healthcare reform, it's gonna die. Self-funding's gonna go away. Well. My state is the bellwether. My state, I'm from Boston, Massachusetts, if you haven't been able to tell by now. <laughs> and I hate the Red Sox, by the way, and I hate the Patriots. <laughs> I do not care about free Tom Brady, all that stuff that you hear about. I don't, I'm actually a big Cleveland fan, it's a long story. Uh, but anyways, the point I'm trying to make is, Massachusetts, my state, the communist state of Massachusetts, the greatest thing about my state is that we were the first state to have an exchange. Romney Care started in Massachusetts. So when people tell me, well, you know, with these exchanges, it's gonna ruin our industry, it's gonna ruin self-funding, I beg to differ. Let me tell you, just look at this slide. 70, almost 74% of the people in my state were in self-funded plans. That's the highest in the country. It's not a coincidence that since we've had an exchange in 2006, now, we have the number, we are number one in this country when it comes to self-funded employee benefit plans. Two, since we passed the health care reform law in 2006, look what's happened. Smaller groups are self-funded. Folks, I want someone to guess. Sorry, my arm hurts a little. Can someone tell me, what do they think it cost? In 2007, when the exchange first came out and they came to a company like myself, my company in 2007 maybe had 50 people, 55. How much do you think it costs for a single person to have health insurance coverage on the exchange in Massachusetts, and we call it the Cadillac plan, but we call it actually it was a Ferrari plan. Anybody want to take a guess what the plan cost a month? Single, not family. Anybody? By the way, this is supposed to be interactive, so unless you start asking questions, I will call on that woman in the back with the blue dress. <laughs> so someone start talking. Yes? $600. $700. $700. Okay, that's enough. Thank you. I'm kidding. Ready? 70. Seven, zero. Now, why was it so cheap? They wanted to get lives. They were banking on people jumping ship and going to the exchanges in my state in 2007 
$70 per employee per month for a single person. Of course, I'm looking at it saying, whoa, this is cheap. Can someone tell me what that same plan costs today? Ma'am? Okay, that's a lot. <laughs> I should say, yes, 2000 Like, who's going to check, right? Eight, it's $800. $70 to $800, same plan, same guy, same gal. 70 to 800. And you wonder why people have left the exchange and have gone to self-funding. We are the state that is the, the epitome of what's gonna happen and what is happening across the country when it comes to self-funded business. There's a reason why Jay Kempton's company, okay, Kempton, when five, 10 years ago, they were doing an RFP you know, a group of 70 lives, maybe he had another small TBA that was trying to get that business. Now he has Blue Cross, United, Cigna, and Aetna trying to get that business. Why? Because they know that it's growing. They know that organizations, people, associations like this one, and doctors and physicians and groups like you all in the audience are starting to grow. And they're looking for alternatives. They actually want pricing available online. They want to change the model. And trust me, I know what the model is because I write and read and see all these contracts. So the bottom line is, in our state, what has happened is, to me, proof of what will happen across this country, except there is one big problem. We need the exchanges to work a little. Now, somebody guess why we need the exchanges to work a little bit? Why would I say that? Why would I say we need the exchanges to work a little bit? Anybody? Okay, good example, he said single payer. Let me tell you why. If the exchanges don't work in any state, what they're gonna do is what they've been doing now in Connecticut, California, Massachusetts, and other states all across the country. They will find ways in that state to make it less likely for your self-funded plan, sir, to be able to self-fund. Because what happens is you have 100 lives. You have a choice. You can either join the exchange or be self-funded. If you're self-funded, you're not in the exchange. Who's in the ex exchange? Sick people. Older people, people that aren't as healthy as other people are in the exchange. They need healthy lives. So when you have a 100 life group that's doing great, you got a great wellness plan, you have initiatives, you're smart, you're strong, you're, you're forward thinking, and you have a great plan design, they're saying, we need to get you and all your people in here. How do they do it? What kind of laws? Self-funded plans are governed by ERISA, okay? This is a federal law that was created in 1974 that regulates all federal law related to health care for employers. So at the end of the day, you're regulated by federal law. So how can the state of Connecticut make it so that you basically are, it's impossible for you to self-fund your benefits? Stop loss. Stop loss coverage. For those of you who need to look at the glossary, stop loss coverage is insurance that you purchase. My company self-funded up to $50,000. That means up to $50,000, it's my risk. I pay every claim up to $50,000 per year for each one of my employees. After that, I submit the claim to a stop-loss carrier, a big insurance company, who reimburses me everything above $50,000. Now, what if a law, and that, by the way, folks, is governed by state law, not by federal law. So what if I told you that they could pass a law in Connecticut that says, it is illegal to have stop loss coverage without a specific deductible of 250,000 unless you're over 500 employee lives. Meaning you could only self fund with stop loss in Connecticut if you have 500 lives or are willing to take on the risk of $250,000 of deductible. Guess what you're doing? You're joining the exchange or you're becoming fully insured because there's no way you could take on that risk. That is real. That is happening right now across this country. That is the number one threat we have. It's happened in Connecticut. In Connecticut, one of the exchange companies wasn't getting enough business. So what do they do? They picked up the phone, they called the insurance commissioner for the state of Connecticut and said, hey, we need some kind of law passed, we need a bulletin, we need something to get more lives into this exchange, otherwise we're gonna collapse and go out of business. So that is a major concern that we have. There's no question about that. But as long as employers and associations like this one speak up and speak to the politicians and speak to the local representatives, these things won't happen on a state level. So with that, costs. What do you care about and why? Okay. 
When I say members, I mean the actual employees, okay? The participants, the patients. What do they actually care about? Anybody want to take a guess? What do members care about when it comes to costs? Out of pocket. Co-pays and deductibles, very good. That's it. That's the problem, okay? Now, it's, I'm not just gonna sit here and blame the patients, but that's a major problem. The major problem that we have is that every person thinks their bill is 25 bucks or $250. That's it. Go to a union plan. Folks, I am from Boston, so basically every person that I know is in a union. My sister-in-law, who works 40 hours a week, yet somehow is at my house swimming 40 hours a week. <laughs> it's funny, guys. Isn't that funny? No? I thought it was. Pretty funny. She's a union glazer. If anyone knows what that is, a is not, there's no glossary term for that. A glazer, she actually installs windows on skyscrapers. Now, in Boston, there are a lot of skyscrapers. That's what she does. She, she weighs about maybe 80 pounds. But she's got a job as a union glazer. Anyways, do you know what her copay is? Five bucks. She told me they were going to strike because they wanted to make it ten. She's the rep for the union. I looked at her, no, this is my sister-in-law, okay? And I'm looking at her going, this is my family. I'm out there preaching this to people and my family is telling me that they want to strike because their copay is gonna be $10. It's a little whacked, but that's the reality. That is what members care about. And this is something we all need to understand when we're talking about transparency. In their minds, everything's transparent. The bill's 10 bucks, the bill's five bucks. What's not transparent about that? They get a bill, it says copay, deductible, $250. It's transparent. They're looking at us going, why are these guys wasting their time on a Saturday morning talking about healthcare transparency when the bill's five bucks? I know what the bill is. I know what my costs are. I guess we could all just go home. Now, what do the plans care about? So their plans, so now you're an employee, you got a 10, ma'am, you got a $10 copay. He's the boss. You just look like a boss, huh? You do, you have that boss look, like you just like, I'm so cool. Excuse me? Oh, the boss is right there? All right, we'll just pretend now. So you're the employee, you have a $5 copay. What does he care about? He's the employer. What does he actually care about? Anybody want to guess? The real problem. What'd you say, Jay? The real problem. I love when I could tell Jay Kempton that I don't believe him. I think he's wrong. I don't think that the employer cares about the real cost. I think some employers do. I'll be honest. Your employers do, okay? Your employers do, but that's why you started this, okay? Your employers care. Most administrators, employers, they don't care about the total cost. They care about what's their exposure up to the spec. That's what they care about. Now, remember when I talked about stop loss? Most employers, when they see an $800,000 bill from a hospital, and I'm telling you, I can go back if you want. I represent 101,000 employers. I'm not saying this because I'm making this up. What the employers say to me on the phone, I know Mr. Arch is standing right there. He ran a TPA. I think he knows what I'm talking about. The first thing they see when it's an $800,000 bill is, wow, that's great. I bought stop loss. My spec's 50,000. My spec's 25,000. All they think about is what is their exposure on that claim. I see every TPA guy nodding his head, sales guys too. That is the first thing. They don't say, whoa, 800,000. They go, is stop loss covering me on this? That's it. So when I see physicians, and I know a lot of you, and you guys are great doctors, you're probably the greatest surgeons ever, you don't know how to sell anything, okay? That's the, it's funny. My God, what's going on? It's true. The problem that we have with, the, with, with our entire association, and when you see physicians groups, anyone who has a great idea, especially doctors, you guys have great ideas with this stuff, the problem is selling it. And when you sell it, you need to know what are the pain points for your clients. And the pain point for your employer client is not the $800,000 bill. His pain point is my specific deductible up to $50,000, am I covered after that? That's what they care about. That needs to change. That has to change. Now, what does the stop loss carrier care about? This is where you make a difference. Jay, what does a stop loss carrier care about? The whole bill. So when you're sitting here trying to sell the TPAs, I would turn around to you and go, you know what, pick up the phone, call every one of the stop loss carriers, especially anyone that has a large, that has services that can uh, that handle large claims. 
and you talk to the HMs, the Symmetras, the high, all these all these stop loss, Sun Life's, the Guardians, the Standard Securities. Talk to all the MGUs. These are the guys who you need to, and, and women who you need to speak to because then, at the end of the day, they're responsible for the entire bill, not the patient, not the employer. Now it will trickle down to the employer and to the patient, but you first have to get the stop loss carriers to realize, hey, wait a second. This is my pocketbook. This is my check. I'm controlling the funds. I'm in charge of how we're spending this money. I want to do something different. I want to make this plan transparent. I want to work with TPAs that believe in transparency. I want to work with f facilities and doctors, et cetera, that have their pricing online. That is big. But the problem you got, again, this is real world, what you see out there. The problem that you have is many, many of these employers, the second one, the plans, many of these employers are controlled by Brokers, the broker is deciding what they do. There is no one else making that decision. They pay a broker a lot of money, a big commission, a big cut to make these decisions for them. And the problem is, what do the brokers care about? Just keeping their client happy. And how do you keep the plan happy? Making sure all they have to worry about is the claim up to spec. So the problem that you have is a big cycle. You got the stop loss carrier who cares about the whole bill. You have employers who do care about the whole bill once they can't get stop loss anymore. <laughs> but that takes a little while. So that's the problem that we need to face is how do we get employers? Because guys, remember this, the large employers, okay? So when I say a large employer, let's say, um, I don't know, a casino, a large casino, Foxwoods. I represent Foxwoods in Connecticut and Mohegan Sun. They're my clients. Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun, folks, they don't have stop loss. They pay all the medical bills with their own money. So they would be caring about the entire bill. But most of the plans that self-fund are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, as we've talked about. They have 50 lives, 100 lives, 200 lives. They all purchase stop-loss coverage. So we have to remember, when we talk about costs, always stick to the back of your head. This guy that I'm talking to, or this woman that I'm talking to, or this employer, what do they really care about? Did they have a situation last year where they had a stop loss policy or premium that doubled or tripled in size. Did they get a laser? Laser means, did they have an employee on their plan who no stop loss carrier will offer coverage to because they're too sick or they're too much of a risk to offer coverage to? That's the things you gotta look at when you realize what do people really care about? But at the end of the day, unless the employees care, none of this is gonna change. And that is what we have designed at our organization to work with many of our employers. I said I represent 101,000 employers. I can tell you right now, we write plan documents for about 20% of them. Maybe 500 plans of the 101,000 that I have, 500 are doing the stuff that you guys want them to be doing. 500. But I can tell you, two years ago, it was none. Now there's 500 and it's growing. You're hearing about all these things, reference-based pricing. Whether you like it or not, I don't care. At least people are talking about something other than a network discount. That is the key, getting them to talk about other things. Brokers, I can tell you right now, I work with a very large, large regional Blue Cross carrier. Blue Cross carrier who is selling reference-based pricing. You hear what I just said? It's Blue Cross Blue Shield Company that is offering reference-based pricing plans. Not under a Blue Cross name, but it's the same people, same organization, claim, same claim system, and they're selling it under a different name, but they're selling reference-based pricing to the same doctors and hospitals that they have network contracts with. So don't tell me the industry's not changing. When you see Blue Cross doing reference-based pricing, you know things are starting to change, and we're seeing more and more of that across the country. Anyone has any questions, please just yell them out or raise your hand, okay? Because there's a lot of stuff going on. Man, that's another two-hour session there. <laughs> transparency and reference base is not the same, okay? Now, I would say transparency is I go on a website, I look at the price, there's the price. That's, that's the price I'm going to pay. Reference base is you're referencing some other number somewhere. You still don't know exactly what that number is, because it's based on Medicare, or it's based on the cost, or it's based on, based on an implant price. It's still based on some type of price, pricing mechanism somewhere else, and then you're adding some type of percentage on top of that as the reimbursement amount. 
would be reference base. Medicare plus is reference base. Cost plus. Anything cost. Anything, anything where you're referencing something outside is reference based. I would say, for example, Dr. Smith's Oklahoma Surgery Center, there's a price. That's not reference based. You're not referencing something else. So I look at that as two different things, but it's on the, at least it's not, I'm getting a discount off of I don't know what. And if you guys would have any idea how much money I would make if I got a dollar for every broker that looks at me and says, yeah, but I get 40% discount with United. <laughs> that's, that, that's what they say. I mean, that's the normal everyday discussion. I'm getting 40% off, 50% off. It's hard to ex ex explain to these people what, what the real situation is. But at the end of the day, what do you guys care about? And I know most doctors hate being called providers, but otherwise I have to write doctors, hospitals, you know, all these different things. So I just say providers, okay, people provide care. What do they care about? What do you guys care about at the end of the day? What? Now when I say you guys, I mean the industry, not people in this room. What does the industry of the hospitals care about? They don't want to justify the charges. And I can tell you this very simply why is my job on a day-to-day -day basis, for those of you who don't know what I do, okay, I'm the CEO of my company, I have a partner of my law firm, I also enjoy my free time, okay, I like to swim, I like to jet ski and paddleboard, those are my three hobbies, okay, that's what I do for fun, all right, hang on my little girls. But my actual love of what I do is to negotiate bills with hospitals. I, it's my, it's literally an addiction. It is. No, I, people smoke, people do heroin, whatever they do. This is, I get itchy at night because I can't settle a claim. I'm nuts when it comes to this. And I can tell you folks, when I'm on the phone with a hospital and I have everything in my back pocket, everything in my arsenal to negotiate a bill and tell them, you got a $2 million bill, the most I'm gonna pay you is $200,000 and they say yes. How in the world does that happen in 10 minutes? How do I get a $2 million bill paid at $200,000? Yeah. Because it's a lot easier not to do what I do. It's a lot easier to hit click, accept discount rate. Very easy to do that. This is the fun stuff. But the problem I got is, when I'm talking to these facilities, what I've noticed is a pattern. When I say I work on negotiate cases, I can, I'm not making this up. In my office, we, have, we right now have open files 47,000 separate claim negotiations that we have going on, 47,000. Each one of these claims is over $50,000. That's the lowest we'll take, is a $50,000 claim. We have 47,000 active claims. We have about, I don't know, 80 people that work on these files. And what I can tell you is across the board, here's what they don't want to do. Justify the rate. It doesn't happen. I have never in my life of negotiating claims, making my living, paying for my mortgage, raising my children with this living, had a facility ever justify what they charged, ever. If there's a facility that's here that tells me this they have with me, we'll stand up. It's never happened. What they'll do is, number one, I have a contract. I have a network contract. I'm like, sir, I have all, guys, I have access to every cost of every implant for every facility, the SKU of what every implant they put into a person, I know exactly what every single facility in the country pays for every implant. And I see that they're upcharging it by 100%. Or storage fees for something they've had in their possession for three minutes. I see these bills, and I've never had someone say, well, here's why I charge that much. <laughs> Ever. And I'm not just a guy that's up here you know, telling, reading some you know, book or referencing something. This is my living. And I've never seen it. And that's why what I do as a living, to me, ma'am, is so easy. It's because nobody does what I do. Literally, there's not that many people that do this type of work. Because it's hard, it's time consuming, it takes risk. You have employers that are freaking out, wondering, is my patient gonna be balanced billed? Folks, when there's a $2 million bill, and they say they got a balanced bill the patient, do you, look at me. They're telling me that they're gonna, you know, well, we're gonna just have to, bill the patient. Do it! Send her the bill for two, for two million bucks. Send it to her. And then we will take the local TV in Peoria. We'll come over. 
hey, ma'am, can I see that? Oh, you got a $2 million health care bill. You could, you could pay that over the next 85 years with $10 monthly installments. I mean, it's insane. But that's the folks, what they, don't, what they realize, they don't justify their charges. Folks, and here's the thing. Is, ma'am, what's your name? I'm sorry. What's your name? All right, Mary. Okay. <laughs> Mary. I speak fluent Polish, okay? I know I'm Adam Russo. I speak fluent Polish. I was, my mother was a first, I'm first generation in this country. My mother moved here from Poland. So I'm surrounded by people's names that you can't pronounce, okay? I don't need to have that on a conference. Just say, you know, Jill, okay? Make it simple. But Gadia? Gadia. Okay. What was I even gonna ask her? Oh. What does she care about? At the end of the day, my copay is $25. My out of pocket is $250. That's it. And the providers, the hospital systems, the big juggernauts, the dialysis facilities, dialysis, end stage, are you kidding me? What they charge for end stage renal disease these days, it's insane. But how can they get away with it? Because Gadia doesn't care. She's getting the treatment, and the person getting the treatment doesn't give a you know what at all. As long as her boss, is making sure she has coverage and she's paying 20 bucks every time she goes. And as long as when that bill hits 50,000 for her, her, her claims are over a million, 800,000 for the year. He doesn't care about that hospital charge because someone else is covering it. Do you notice that? It's always past the buck. She's not worried about it. He's not worried about it. The stop loss carrier is worried about it. And the facilities know that. Do you have any idea, folks, how many cases I have Remember, I get paid on a percentage of what I save, okay? Do you have any idea how many cases that I have in my office where I only need a couple more days? And I look at the employer in the face, I'm like, sir, give me two more days, I will get this ca case settled, and I will save $400,000 on this bill. He goes, close it now. It's not your money, sir. His spec is 100,000. He doesn't care that I just need two more days. You know why? Because his HR director is screaming at him because the patients, Gadia and Jill and Mary and all the other ones, are going to HR complaining that they can't refinance their house because their credit's being tagged. They're getting collections calls. They're getting letters in the mail. They're going to HR. HR is going to you, sir. You now, these are people that have worked for you for 30 years, 40 years. You want them unhappy? You are like, I don't want to lose her. I don't want her crying in the bathroom. I want her working productively. I didn't hire her for her to cry all day. You say, Close the file. Do you have any idea how many cases I work on? I'm told to close the file because I don't have enough time to get the claim settled. So on that million dollar bill, where if I had a couple extra weeks, I could get it done at 300,000, it gets paid with a 20% network discount. Done. Every day. Every single day. So when you say to me, transparency, I say to you, Gadea doesn't care, her employer doesn't care, and the providers know it. So how do we change that model? And that's what I focus on every single day is changing that model. And when you have a reference-based pricing option, when you have transparency, and you don't have these network contracts sitting out there, because that network contract, folk, what happens is they take advantage of it. They know that they have a contract. They know, hey, listen, this is what it says. When I show a provider a charge on a $2 million charge, and I showed them that the most they should have charged on this claim is $400,000, let us say. You realize their answer isn't to justify it, right? I said that. Their answer is, you don't have a right to audit the bill. So the fact that I did audit the bill and had these findings, they go, you didn't have a right to audit it in the first place. And a lot of times, they're correct. And I'm gonna show you why in just a second. So. Providers will continue to take advantage as long as the players, and we talked about who they are, don't agree that the overall costs are the real problem. Gadea has to believe that the overall cost is the problem, not her copay. Her employer has to believe the overall cost is the problem, not his deductible. And that is a fundamental flaw that we have in self-funding, is that those two entities, which are a big piece of the pie, don't really care. How do we make that change? It starts with plan design. So how do we change the dynamic? Transparency. But true transparency. I'm gonna make a very simple question, okay? How do I get my employees? What are my employees, see this suit? Okay, I think I got a pretty nice suit on, okay? You know what my employees think? If I put in a plan design 
that's going to save the plan money. As the employer, I'm going to save the plan money. What do the employees think? Where's that money going? To my suit. <laughs> to my car. To my wife. To my sister in Spain who's been t taking advantage of me of the fact I told her, if I am ever successful, I will take care of you. That was 20 years ago. The girl still, I pay for her flights home every single summer. <laughs> she did design our logo though, so I give her that credit. But at the end of the day, they think that money's coming to me. What do they care? How do you get Gidea to care about transparency? Pay her. You pay her. You pay her. Easy, simple. That's all you gotta do. So the bottom line at the end of the day, let me read to you what the network contracts say. Folks, if anybody here is in a network contract, I'm assuming many of you are, we read them all, we have them all. We have a bank, okay? All those so-called confidential contracts that you, never, that you never see, can't hear, I have every one of them. I collect them. It's like a squirrel with nuts, okay, in the winter time. I literally have every contract that you could think of. If a stop loss carrier asked me to, have, to show them every stop loss policy they, that we have, we got every single company's stop loss policy going back five years. I got every hospital contract going back, I don't know how many years. Because of all these cases, you end up getting a lot of this stuff in depositions and just, you know, some random guy slipping you one in the bathroom of a conference. <laughs> it happens. It really does. So, they are averse to the free market approach. All right, read this paragraph. Participating provider, you, agrees to keep and hold its fee schedule confidential. Participating provider shall not disclose such fee schedule except in standard billing to GDEA or the TPA, or is otherwise necessary to ensure payment. So all you're allowed to do is show the fee schedule to Gadea when she gets her bill. Now when she gets her bill, what does it say in the area where it says total due? 25. Everybody here gets bills. We all have, like my wife, I always get nervous when the Nordstrom bill comes, okay? Very nervous. And I know that she's telling me, well, the total due is 125. <laughs> Hello, you charged 3,000 last month. Yeah, the total minimum due is 125. So she's looking at that bold number, 125. Gidea is looking at the bold number, 25. She's not looking at 80,000, 100,000. It says right there. Why not? You're not allowed to share that information or price, put those prices online. And there's a big time reason for that. Because if you start sharing your prices, they make less money. They make money by people like Gadea and her employer not knowing what the actual charges are. So I know that Dr. Makari's here. You can stand up, I don't know where he is. He's right there, okay? Guys, if you have a chance to read his book, I had the pleasure to speak at a conference last month in Montana. Um, and actually got to read his book, Unaccountable, and I read it on the entire flight home, and it's an amazing, an amazing book. And when I talk about all these, you know, thousands and thousands of cases that I work on, I've always thought, in my mind, that the biggest scam artists, and it's just based on my work, okay, not on any study, are children's hospitals. By far, they do amazing work, I am sure. I know they do, okay? We've all, I mean, a, a cancer has touched almost a, probably every single person in here, right? But I'm like, man, these guys seem to make a lot of money for a nonprofit. Salaries of three CEOs of children's hospitals ranges from 5.1 to 5.9 million. One study estimated a hospital gets paid $10,000 extra per surgical complication. Last but not least, 2009, Texas Children's Hospital recorded a $275 million profit, and the one in Philadelphia, $359 million profit for a nonprofit. Okay, profit for a nonprofit. But they all ask for money. They're all collecting. There's penny, pen, you know, people throw pennies into a jar to help the children's hospital. Where's that money going? And that's part of the problem is that Gidea and her family and everyone in this room think these facilities need our money. <laughs> you know what's so funny, right? When the NFL had the, um, that case with the Cincinnati Bengals player, the daughter, I uh, forget his name, but she has cancer, right? And the NFL gave like many, many millions to Cincinnati Children's. I'm sitting there going, of all the hospitals in this country, and there's a lot of rural, rural ones that actually need money. There are. 
You go to a Navajo, I go to a lot of Indian reservations because I represent casinos. You have any idea how many casinos I go to and I'm meeting with the owners of the casino, the rich Native American guys, and I look at their reservation and everyone's poor except for the 10 of them. And I'm like, what is their hospital? Their hospitals have beds, but yet Cincinnati Children's is getting $25 million from the NFL. Why is that money going to a rural hospital in the middle of New Mexico? instead of the hospital that doesn't need it. Another story for another day. But the bottom line is, this is all what needs to be told. And I always tell people, who in the world, other than you, sir, is gonna go to the Boston Globe and say how much Children's Hospital in Boston the CEO makes, and put that down, and make that a negative, when the entire board of directors at Children's Hospital is made up of every, all the most powerful people in the city of Boston are sitting on that board. It's very hard to fight a Children's Hospital because who in the world wants to be the lawyer suing the children's hospital? <laughs> Not me. I don't sue, and they know that. So that's something we need to think about. So when you talk about risk management, folks, and all the things that you can do, what I tell people all the time, this is everything. Medical tourism. Folks, it's very important for people to realize this, all right? And I give a lot of kudos to Dr. Smith. He is probably the greatest marketer I know. This guy knows. I, He's amazing. If I, wherever I am, Disney, you're there. Wherever I go, I see him. But what is medical tourism? Can someone tell me what they think? Gidea, what do you think medical tourism is? Stop there. She is 100% wrong, okay? <laughs> she just said people from other countries. That's what everyone thinks. It's got to be some other country. You know what medical tourism is? Tulsa. Medical tourism is any place, anywhere that you have a direct deal with where someone has to get in a car or a plane or on a bicycle or a helicopter and they can just go there and get care. That is medical tourism. That's what I call medical tourism. We have direct contracts with facilities all over the country. You know how many people, and this is a kudos to you again, I'm in Boston, they go, you know, I want a direct contract with that Dr. Smith in Oklahoma. I'm like, okay, but you realize that you can do the exact same thing in New Hampshire. That's why you guys need to come to these things, is that this is not something that only has to be in Oklahoma. They have got, there, I met people here last year from Maine. I didn't realize that there were people with pricing online in Maine. I always thought it was just you. But that is the point, is that this mess has to spread because as long as you have transparent prices where a person, can, an employer like yourself can go do a direct contract with a facility, pay that price, and find a way to get your employers th employees there. It's called Uber. <laughs> really? Now, I'm going to be straightforward with you, okay? I look at Dr. Smith's pricing online in our plan. He is not the cheapest on everything he does. He's not. But that's the point. I can look at his prices, compare it to the price I can get locally, and then where it makes sense, incentivize my employees to come to Oklahoma and see Dr. Smith. But it doesn't mean that because your price is transparent that it's cheap. It's just you could actually shop and compare. You can compare how many errors there are, how many infections there are, how many people complain about them online on Yelp, or whatever, whatever it is. That's the point. Carve-outs. Carve-outs are really simple. Carve-out is when you carve something out of the plan that is not part of a network contract. It is the hardest thing to do. So for example, dialysis. People love to try to carve out dialysis. If you are with the Cigna network, and you go to DaVita or Fresenius, anybody know those organizations? I wish I owned those places, man. Making big money for a long time. Those two organizations, DaVita and Fresenius, they are part of the Cigna network. But yet employers try to carve them out and pay them at Medicare plus 20, Medicare plus 30, Medicare plus 40, whatever it might be. Or have a certain price, a reference price that they will pay those facilities. Good, I'm happy you're trying. I'm happy you're putting that effort in. But you realize that Cigna, those facilities, they don't call you. They don't call your TPA. The first thing they do, they call Cigna. Hey, Cigna, you got a bad apple out there. You got an employer who doesn't want to pay us based on our network contract. You have an employer that's trying to pay us based on some other method, Medicare Plus or whatever it might be. I want you to put the foot down. So what happens? Cigna doesn't call you, sir. They call your third-party administrator. 
And they go, hey, you like that contract that we have, huh? For all of your groups. You got 500 groups over here. You got this one group over there who's causing us a little bit of trouble. Either you get that guy in line, or I'm going to drop that Cigna contract from all of your business. Every single day, I get that call. Or one of my guys. Every day. They don't justify. They don't justify why something that should cost $8,000, they're charging $100,000 with a 30% discount. They don't justify it. They just come to you and say, sir, we know that every broker that you work with, every employer that you work with, every Gadea that you work with loves the fact that they have a $5 or $10 or $15 copay with Cigna. They like seeing the word Cigna on their ID cards. If you want access to that Cigna logo, you will put that guy in line now. And my job is to then call that guy, try to work out a deal, but nine out of 10 times, you fold. That's transparency in our country, in our healthcare system with self-funded plans. This is what we need to do. So how do you change it? Employee skin in the game. You get them paid. You pay people. Folks, I love Oklahoma City. I've had a great time here. I've hung on the Brickyard or Bricktown or whatever it's called. <laughs> I forget what even happens over there sometimes. But I've had a great time in this town many times. It's not easy to get someone to decide on their own to take a flight from Boston to Atlanta, wait two hours, get on a plane from Atlanta to Oklahoma, and then go see the great Dr. Smith, even though I could put him in this great hotel. The only way they're gonna do it is if they're making real money. Not waiving their copay, but giving them cash back based on the percent that we save by them doing it. That's what we do. We give our employees 20% back as cash on any amount that we actually save. So if we have a bill that would have cost us 80,000 and because of some other thing, whether it's you, whether it's you sir, whether another doctor, and they spend 10 and we spend 5,000 on room and board, et cetera, 80,000 minus the 20,000 we spent, 60,000 they get 20% of the $60,000 as cash, 20%. Goes back to their pocket. That's real. How else do we incentivize our employees? Now, I, my job, my company's job is we identify fraud in a lot of cases. We look for overpayments and claims. We do that. That's a big part of our business. Who is the best person to identify mistakes with your bill? Gadea. You, I, I owe you a drink. It's morning. Maybe you want like a Bloody Mary afterwards. But I owe you a favor for, for being my guinea pig here today. I appreciate that. She is the best person to look at the bill. Do you have any idea how many employers and TPAs and organizations have these claims reviewed by 10 companies. Great organizations, great algorithms in their, in, their, in their claims data, great software. There's great companies here that have great stuff. I'm not putting my company down, we do it too. But no matter how good a job I can do scrubbing her claim for her kids, she could do a better job. How do you get her to actually look at the bill and care about what they actually charge for? You pay her. Our plan, in it, and guess what guys, when I say this, it's the only time the brokers in the room stop drinking and get a pen and write it down, literally. Every broker, when I say the next words, write this down. Every Blue Cross, every United, every, every single administrator in the country is okay with you putting into your plan design that your employees get incentive and a reward if they can find errors in their bill. My employees and my clients' employees, you know what they do on a Friday night? You sit there with your wife and your two kids with some candles and some pizza, and you're looking for problems with your bills. Why? Because you can pay for your summer vacation by all the errors that you can find in your bills. That's what they do. We give them 20% back. Any error they find, anything they find in their bill that they do not have to pay, because of that, 20% of that money goes back to the employees. That's transparency. That's incentives. Now she's looking at it going, man, how is this 80000 I could have went to Philadelphia and got the service for 20, or I could have went to Boston and got it done for 30. Now, go back to my earlier slides. She's not only looking at a copay and a deductible. What is she doing, Jay? She's looking at the entire bill. That's what we need to create a system of. And until we have places like Oklahoma Surgery Center where she can actually go online and look at comparisons, it's not gonna work. That's why we need more of your organizations out there so that when people and employers, so when you get your data from your third party administrator, you can see how much the charges are. You could then go on websites like FMMA, find companies, find organizations and gr uh, physician groups that have pricing online and compare what it is that you are paying in your town in LA, in Beverly Hills, you fancy guy you, 
with what they're paying somewhere else. And that's true transparency. Okay, I think I have to end it. I know I have a bunch of some more stuff that I have to do, but can I just get two more minutes? That's okay. So last thing I want to make sure, two things I want to bring up. Auditing access to data. You need to have access to the claims data. Luckily, if you're with a self-funded plan with a third-party administrator, you can actually get your claims data. So an employer can have their third-party administrator or broker look at the data and see what is it that you're paying, where are your pain points, what claims are killing your plan the most, what areas. Is it you have a lot of obese people? Do you have a lot of people with lung problems? Do you have a lot of people with dialysis? Do you have a lot of people with diabetes? Whatever it might be. And use that information. That is something that you have access to that if you were with a Blue Cross, United, Cigna, or Aetna, they fight to death not to share that information. In the state of Michigan, there's a lawsuit right now. One of the largest union employers sued Blue Cross Blue Shield. All they wanted was access to their own data on their own union members to see what they were spending and what they were spending it on. And Blue Cross said, no. It's their money. No, that's confidential. The, the discount that I have with you, Doc, that's confidential. The discount I have with that hospital, that's confidential. They didn't want to share the charge information. That's the problem that we have in our country. Last but not least, I want to make sure I bring up a couple things. Fiduciary duty, that's why it's near the end, right? The fiduciary duty, I want to bring this up. What you have to remember, right, is that every one of these employers has a fiduciary duty to be prudent with plan assets. They have a duty to be prudent with their plan's money. There will be a day where one of these employees of one of these unions who is now having, instead of a $20 copay, it's 30. Or they're told they have to have a high deductible plan of a couple thousand instead of their normal plan. There's gonna come a day where one of these members is gonna sue the plan and their fiduciary of the plan and say, how have you been spending my money? Are you overspending on the claims? Why aren't you being prudent with my plan assets? If you look up fiduciary duty lawsuits on a, under Google, all you see is 401k plans. Every 401k plan, every large you know, insurance company has been sued under 401k for, missed, for not spending your money correctly when it comes to stocks, bonds, mutual funds, et cetera. Find me a lawsuit of a patient suing their plan for a fiduciary breach for the employee benefit plan under the health claims. Doesn't exist. Why? She only cares about the 10 bucks. At the end of the day, the reason why you don't see a union member in Wisconsin, when they had all those strikes, where they try to de-unionize all that stuff, I'm sitting there going, why aren't these unions suing their own union plan trustee for working with, quote unquote, Aetna, who has been overspending by tens of millions of dollars a year, all their, that's their money, that's their payments, that's their contributions that are going and paying these claims. Why aren't they suing? because they don't even know. And that's our problem. So with that, I'm gonna end it. I apologize for getting, look at all this. I apologize. But I only got an hour. Usually I like to have like five. <laughs> it's really true, I could talk literally through lunch. It wouldn't be a problem. If you ever wanna talk to me, I'm gonna be here for a little bit longer. Feel free to see me in the back. If you ever wanna talk, email me, call me, whatever you wanna do. I love this business, I love what I do, I am grateful for the fact that I was able to have a relationship with Mr. Kempton and uh, with Oklahoma Surgery Center as well and the fine people here. I made some great connections here, great people, great brokers that are actually here. If you're a broker who's here, I met one of the best brokers in the country here at this conference last year. So thank you very much for the time and keep up the good fight. Thank you.